You are listening to Season 2, Episode 49 of the Fly the W670 Podcast. You can't spell Tyone without an L. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to our podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and Fly the W on Facebook. Email us, Fly the W670 at gmail.com. Well, Crowley, we've uh, reached the uh, 4th of July weekend, and the uh, Cubs have definitely let us down after the series against the Guardians at home. Yeah, you know, we were coming up after the London series with this critical 13 game stretch and they started the homestand one and five, which, you know, just isn't going to cut it. You have uh, wildfire, smoke problems, rain delay problems and a whole bunch of losses. So not good. Not good at all. Game one, we've got the lefty Justin Steele on the mound for the Cubs. Yeah, Steele versus Quantrell and the Cubs win this one 10 to one and Cub fans are feeling good, right? After scoring only one run twice in the series against the Phillies, the Cubs offense came alive. It started in the third when the Cubs loaded the bases with one out. Nico Horner hit a single to score uh, two runs, making it two to nothing. That was the first Cubs lead since scoring four against the Cardinals in the first inning on London on Sunday. So it's been a while. In the fourth, Cody Bellinger and Jan Gomes hit back-to-back singles. And then Jared Young hit another triple his second in two games to make it for nothing. Get this, Dustin. According to Chris Karma, Jared Young is the first Cubs first baseman to hit a triple in consecutive games since Derek Lee, July That's 1st amazing. and 2nd, 2005. Almost to the date on top of it, right? Right. Mike Talkman would hit an RBI single. Morell would hit a sack fly, and the Cubs were up 6 nothing after four. In the bottom of the six, Magical hit his first home run as a Cub. His first home run since June 4th, 2021. His third career home run. Everything's coming up Cubs, Dustin. Everything coming up Cubs. I think uh, Nikki Magical hit that for my birthday. It was my birthday on Friday, Crowley. Oh, happy so, birthday. Yeah, the Cubs uh, The Cubs got me a win on my birthday. That was about it. Christopher Morell would add a two-run home run, and the Cubs were up 9 nothing. Trey Mancini would hit a sack fly in the seventh, and the Cubs were up 10 nothing. The offense scored 10 runs on 13 hits two home runs, and they went four for nine with runners in scoring position. They left five men on base. But the story of the game was Justin Steele making his third start since coming off the IL. He continues to look stronger every time out. Little dicey in the first. first bat- he hits the first batter he faces. Then uh, Steele uh, got a Mod Rosario to bounce one right back to him to set up a double play. He throws it in the outfield. So he's got runners at first and second, no outs. But he struck out the next two batters and got a ground out to end the threat. After that, Steele settles in, and it was easy cruising. He went 6.1 innings, giving up three hits, zero runs, one walk, and six Ks. Michael Fulmer, Anthony K., Michael Rucker come out of the pen. Rucker gave up a solo home run in the ninth to make it 10-1. to So since July 22nd, 2022, Justin Steele has a 199 ERA in 102 innings over 22 starts. That's the lowest ERA and MLB over that span among pitchers with at least 100 innings pitched. His 243 ERA is 15 starts, ranked second in MLB, uh, right behind Shane McClellan of Tampa Bay. Uh, uh, David Ross said after the game, he's a horse, man. Every time he takes the bump, he feels like a guy that it's a win day. He loves to take the ball. He's been really good, man. He turned into an ace. And I, I, he's proven it. Steel on Sunday could become. And so when you take a look at that, I felt that this guy had an ace possibility at the beginning of the year. We talked about it. We had him out to Club 400. Just absolutely fun watching him do what he does. Yep, stronger and stronger each start out, Crowley. Looking like a guy that could anchor a staff for a long time. And he's a lefty. That's pretty impressive stuff dating back to uh, 2022 with the 1.99 ERA. Right. And so, you know, Cub fans are feeling good. This is this is what I talked about. I predicted the Cubs win two out of three. They take the Steel and Stroman, lose the Tyone. That's not what happened, though, unfortunately. The Cubs would lose six to nothing. You know, you, you had to be excited, right? You had Stroman on the mound. You had a good offensive performance. Didn't happen. Fans had to weigh out a two-hour and 45-minute rain delay, um, and it was a 9 p.m. start. Unbelievable. So, I mean, that's just, you know, and I know the weather just kept getting worse as the weekend went on, but, boy, I think that put a little bit of a, you know, it affects both teams, but uh, but I get it. I mean, that, that would screw me up. Right. Stroh didn't have his best stuff, and the Guardians kept getting clutch hits. 
Stroh struck out four guardians in the first two innings, but ran in tumble to trouble in the third. He's going to walk with two outs. He's going to walk Bo Naylor. He gave up a double to Stephen Kwan. And then Ahmad Rosario would single. The Cubs were down two to nothing. With one out in the sixth, Stroh gave up back-to-back singles to Jose Ramirez and Josh Naylor. He got Josh Bell to pop up, but Andres Jimenez, who had a monster series, singled to make it three to nothing. Stroh was pulled from the game with two outs, runners at the corners for Julian Merriweather, who's been pitching great. But the first batter he faced, Will Brennan, singled to make it four to nothing. And then Miles Straw would single. The ball would go under the glove of Cody Bellinger. Two more runs would score. The Guardians led six nothing. So Strowman went 5.2 innings. He gave up five hits, five run. Two of those charged to him, though, were on uh, singles given up by Merriweather, who a lot. You know, those were inherited runners. Right. Two walks, seven Ks. Uh, Merriweather was charged with one unearned run on the air by Bellinger. Javier Assad mopped it up, going three innings, giving up no runs in five Ks. Get this, Dustin. All six of the Guardians' runs were scored with two outs in the inning. Well, that That's what stings, right? That that That's a stinger. And obviously it stings when the Cubs can't get anything done on offense. Right. And so the Guardians didn't really need those six runs as the Cubs offense used up all their runs Friday night. They managed only five (laughs) hits, five hits, Dustin, three by Cody Bellinger, one by Hap, one by Tucker Barnhart. So, I mean, basically, other than Cody Bellinger, the Cubs had two hits. Uh, Bellinger had the only extra base, had a double. The team went 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. They left seven men on base and they struck out a whopping 13 times. Uh, see, that's just – that's the part, Crawley. 13 strikeouts for a team with no pop. It seemed like a team that didn't want to be there, didn't like the late start. Yeah, and and then they they had multiple base runners only twice in two innings in the game, the fourth and the sixth. They came up short both times. So that's a frustrating loss because now we get to game three, a Tyone start and the title of this episode, you can't spell Tyone without an L. Tyone versus Aaron Savali. What are we going to say about Tyone that we haven't said? It's basically an automatic loss every time. Every time out. The Cubs, I saw a stack, Crowley, they're three or four games over 500 in games that he does not start. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, he gave up, he went five innings, he gave up seven hits, six runs, five earned with six Ks. He gave up a two run home run to Andres Jimenez. Again, monster series in the third and by the time he was pulled when he left the game after the fifth inning the cubs were down six nothing an office an awful performance by tyone he puts his team in a hole every time out every single time he's just it's put too way too much contact it seems like he's throwing softballs up there to these guys and especially lefties that's that, that's the thing that kind of just blows your mind is, is against lefties he is just awful and, you know, it wasn't like the offense was all that much better. If you were looking at it, they really didn't do much. They scored a run in the fifth on a Mike Talkman ground out, but they looked lifeless the rest of the game until the eighth inning when the Cubs would start their comeback. Bottom of the eighth, Christopher Morrell hits a solo home run to make it 6-2. to two. He now leads the team in home runs, even though he didn't start until the first week of May. Isn't that crazy? Yes, and so, you know, that made it 6-2 to two in the 8th. But then in the ninth, Cleveland puts out their stud closer, Emmanuel Claus. You figure you're going you're gonna to put this one away quickly, but the Guardians tried to give this one away. Claus walks the leadoff batter, Jared Young, which, again, something that you never do. Um, and then after that, Jan Gomes would fly out, but then there's two pass balls by the catcher, Cam Crazy. Gallagher. Two pass that, balls. Yeah, that puts Young at third. And then all of a sudden, the first baseman for the Guardians just somehow forgot how to play first. Um, That was Naylor. And so when you you talk about that right there, you know, Josh Naylor just had trouble coming up with balls in the inning. And so, uh, you know, once that happens, Trey Mancini hit an RBI single to make it six to three. The Cubs would load up the bases by singles by Talkman and Horner. And then Christopher Morrell comes up clutch again, Again. a two run single to make it six to five with runners at the corners. One out Cody Bellinger hits a sack fly. We got a brand new ball game. It is tied at six. Wrigley was rocking. Say grounds out to end the inning. And then we go into extras. Dustin. And then it gets interesting again. 
Yep, the bullpen kept the Cubs in this game after Tyone's start. Rucker and K pitched scoreless innings. Hayden Wisniski pitched two scoreless innings. So they kept a minute. Adbert Alzali, that's the man we wanted, comes on with relief. Uh, with Andres Jimenez as the Manford man starting the inning at second, Ahmad Rosario single to put runners at the corners. Now he gets Jose Ramirez to ground out. That put runners at second and third with lefty Josh Naylor up, Dustin. And this is where we get some controversy here. Naylor's the cleanup hitter, right? He's hitting 301, and he was already two for four on the day, and he's a lefty, right, versus the righty Alzali. I was wondering, and I wanted your take on this, why Ross would not walk him, especially when he fell behind two and one. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Makes all the sense in the world in hindsight. No doubt about it. So now on a two to two pitch, Alzali, look, it wasn't a bad pitch. The guy threw a 96 mile per hour fastball. It was high out of the zone. It wasn't a great pitch. Right. And Naylor just had a great piece of hitting. He drove it up the middle. The Guardians took an eight to six lead. The next two batters were Josh Bell, who is one and five with a 228 average, and Will Brennan, who has a 273 hitter, who is one for four. I don't know. I just would have rather faced those two guys than Naylor, but didn't happen. The Cubs did nothing in the tenth, and the Guardians took the series two to one. And so, you know, like I was saying earlier, you're you're sitting here, and now you come back from the London series. Excuse me, real quick, and they. Uh, <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> came back from the london series and now they just lost five of six at home you're now six games under 500 and six games out of first <laughs> yeah just a really disappointing trip we all said when they got back from london this was a crucial crucial stretch and to start at home in that fashion they've really you know not only have they left the fans down, they've they left themselves down. They were a game away. If they would have swept the Cardinals in London, they would have came back at 500. And now here we are, as you just mentioned, six games under 500 and six games out of first place. And uh, you're now talking, we're going to have uh, – yeah, go ahead. You're, you're talking about Tyone, Dustin, and and yep. and the Cubs are 2-12 and 12 when Tyone pitches. <laughs> Excuse me. That is a 20% – 27% of their losses have come from one pitcher. Yeah, he, one needs pitcher. To get like a, he needs to get like a phantom forearm strain or something. There's got to be, you know, Javier Assad's got to be able to do better than that, I would guess. You, you got to figure out someone at this point to do better because right now it is just awful. And, and he's, it, it, you know, what are his teammates thinking? I mean, they have to know that when they come out there that they're going to be in a hole. That might be part of it, right? That might be, that might be part of it. That might be part of the mental approach at the plate. Um, Hayden Wisniewski would give you a better option. Maybe switch their two roles for a little bit, if anything, right? It's, it's, their it's, roles. it's so hard, but the, that stat you mentioned by Matt Snyder on CBS Sports, yes. the Cubs are 2-12 and 12 when Jamison Tyone starts, 36-32 and 32 when they don't. So they're a four-game over 500 team when Tyone doesn't start. And so this is a problem because this is very similar to Zach Davies, if you remember when they got him in the U Darvish trade. This is similar to Tyler Chatwood when they got him. It's automatic losses every time out, but you're paying this guy. Davies wasn't that bad, but you're paying, you know, Tyone a lot of money. Like you said, phantom injury, may, maybe kind of let him clear his head before the all-star break, take an extended, uh, ext extended vacation, extended break, get himself mentally right. But you know, Tommy Hadovy, you know, Craig Driver, you know, uh, Daniel Mosco, you know, all these guys are looking at video. They're trying to figure this out. How much of it is physical? How much of it is mental? How much of it is both? We don't know, man, but, but it cannot keep going, uh, the way that it currently is. Yeah. And we've got, uh, Tommy Hadavi on this week with the Mully and Haw show. I believe that'll be Wednesday or Thursday this week. So that will obviously be one of many of the questions we will address with him. This is Season 2, Episode 49 of the Fly the W670 Podcast. You can't spell Tyone without an L. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W Podcast. Crowley's talking to Frank Walker from the Miss Identities Podcast. 
My next guest on Fly the W podcast should be a familiar face for those of you subscribed to the Scores YouTube channel. You've seen him around Wrigley Field. He is the host of the Mistaken Identity podcast, Frank Walker. How are you doing today, Frank? I am great and excited to be here with you on your podcast, which I love, by the way. Thank you, thank you, and 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 and, and you know, you guys just kicked off season three. We're going to get to talking about your podcast, but I want to know, Frank, for all the Cub fans to get to kind of bump into you and see you at Wrigley, how did you get? Have you always kind of been a baseball fan or a Cub fan? How did you get into working at Wrigley Field? Good question, because I was not. So I went to Lane Tech, which is down the street on Addison. I was 16 years old, and the Cubs had a booth uh, in our lunchroom. Uh, they were hiring ushers for the time, uh, for the summer. Uh, and I asked my mom, hey, can I just do this? She goes, you know, what do you know about the – we were a Bulls fan. They had won the championship back-to-back. -back. I'm like, I'll just do that for one year. I mean, just, let me just try it one time. Um, that was 1994. Uh, I was an usher. And as you know, 2023, um, my first job is still my current job. Um, and I got hooked into it after being a really for a while. Sammy Sosa was just – amazing to me uh harry carey and just the vibe and the atmosphere and uh i forgot about the bulls that year and next thing you know it's all cubs every day all day all day and, and and the fun thing is that you know you get to kind of be at the games and obviously you're working i've seen you work man you're you're going non-stop during a game but you do get to catch moments of different ball games and kind of you're part of the crowd you're part of the ambiance of wrigley field Yes, uh, and, and, and and it's amazing because uh, no two days are ever um, the same. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. I never thought I'd be at a three-hour rain delay over the weekend, and that's great people who were there from out of town. Um, but no two days are the same. You never know what you're going to get. People come from all over the world uh, to really feel, and uh, it's just an amazing place, amazing experience, and it's good to be a part of it. So you've been at Wrigley close what, 30 years now, you know? And so when you think about that, over that time, you've got to kind of see and meet and talk to a lot of different players. You mentioned Sammy. What other players to you have really kind of meant a lot to you during your time at Wrigley Field? Yes, and I did go to college and come back for a while. But I would say that Derek Lee, a uh, huge fan of Derek Lee, I got to uh, escort him during the Cubs convention. Um such a big guy. I feel like he can play right now. He just looks like he can play still. He, like he can still go. So Derek Lee. Um, and of course, everybody knows me for Jason Hayward. More so, though, because I have a background in mentoring and working with young people. And Jason Hayward does that so uh, eloquently. I just, I just, I'm, I'm impressed with what he does off the field. Um, so Jason Hayward is probably the one everybody knows me for. Uh, but it is mostly because just the way he carries himself. He's a good role model for people like me. Uh, my son as well. So uh, Jason Hayward, definitely up there. And, and, you know, another good guy that's for mentoring right now that has just impressed me just seeing him work with kids is Stro. Uh, just yes. got his all-star, all-star. Um, he got selected the all-star team, but just watching what Stro's done with inner city youth and kind of coming out and giving, you know, giving his time, you know, I think, I think that's a big part of it too. And so when you talk all the guys that you mentioned, uh, you know, especially Derek Lee and Hayward and, and Stro. Those are all guys that really do give back. Not all the guys are like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was at the uh, Club 100 event where he had the, the young people there. That he, I, think he, I think he ordered a bus for them and bought them all custom-made jerseys, I believe. And uh, it was just amazing to be a part of that experience. Uh, and to this day, he still reaches out to those kids. I believe it's the Lost Boys, I believe. Yeah, it's uh, Lost Space, yeah. Yeah, he still works with them. I mean, it's, it's genuine. It's true. And it's just cool to see. And, and the same thing with Hayward is he's never been a guy that has to like call the press out to watch him do this stuff. It's no. stuff he, they do on their own time, man. And when you play 162 games, that's really hard. Now with your podcast, with Mistaken Identity, you do kind of go behind the scenes. You know me, I, I love the employees of Wrigley, Wrigley Field. To me, they are a huge part of what makes the friendly confines friendly. And, and you bring a lot of them onto your show. Tell us a little bit about your uh, podcast, Mistaken Identity. Yeah, so it's Mistaken Identity Beyond the, the Ballpark. Uh, we talk more about the personal side of it. We don't discuss uh, baseball or business. Uh, that's up to the Cubs to do that. So we don't represent the Cubs. But a lot of people don't know that, you know, the usher that they see every day or the security guard that they see every day has a law degree or has three master's degrees. And, you know, uh, sometimes I'll be there and 
a person, a fan, uh, which is very, very rare. Most of the fans are great. But somebody, you know, I curse a person out. I'm like, my God, that's somebody's mom. No, that's somebody's um, that's somebody's aunt or dad. Uh, so the podcast was designed, uh, it came out of COVID, by the way, but it was designed to look at the personal lives of the people that work at Wrigley Field and some of the players. We've had Andre Dawson on. Uh, I didn't even know that he was a funeral director until the podcast, actually. Um, but it's good to see what people do outside of Wrigley Field because they're human and they have lives. Uh, so that podcast is based about just sharing their stories. Uh, and we have a lot of good feedback from some of the fans as well that came by and say, wow, I did not know that my usher, who's been there for 14 years, uh, lives all the way in Wisconsin and drives to Wrigley Field every day. So it's pretty cool to see people uh, come out of their shell and talk about what they do in their personal life on their personal time. And, and, and again, you guys got to put up with a lot. You know, some people feel entitled to certain things. Some people get the beer muscles going. And, and like you said, everybody there just is really a good hearted person. And, and when they're asking fans to do something, usually all they're doing is just their job. What they've been told, here are the rules, here are how you handle certain situations. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's, that's the cool thing about uh, the podcast because, uh, you know, you get to see people um, in, in a personal light. And, and, you know, and once you learn about people and you become educated about people and different things, you tend to have a better appreciation for what's going on around you. Uh, one of the most unique stories that I've heard is, uh, you know, one of our staff members who lives in who lives in Massachusetts and actually flies in uh, for a week of games, flies back home. And like I, I would have never known that somebody lives in Massachusetts, but works with the Cubs uh, without the podcast. So you get to hear those kind of unique stories. And, and what I've known over the years is that you guys are like a family, right? It, it, yeah. It's really like a bond between the employees at Wrigley Field and, and everybody kind of helping out and, and, and just you enjoy each other's company is what I see when I, when I interacted. I remember, I don't know if it was in COVID or right after maybe 2021, still during that time period. But, I, you know, a couple of us came on to talk to, you know, talk to the employees about our experiences and how much we love all the workers at Wrigley Field that do make it such a magical place. Yeah, you know, it started because of the, you know, the, the pandemic took our season away and most of our staff went a whole year without seeing anybody at all. Uh, so we decided to do a virtual type of uh, event that was during the convention weekend. Uh, we had uh, many, many people on. Julian Green came on. Uh, our managers, our bosses came on. Um, uh, Mark Pryor, uh, Kerry Wood, Ryan Dempster, Kyle Swober, uh all came on. And that's actually how the podcast actually started, because we all came together not to discuss work, uh, but to enjoy each other's company and talk about our personal lives and what was going on during COVID. And from there, we just kept it going. And voila, there's a podcast about it. And, and so let me ask you, Frank, as you sit there and you kind of reflect, what are your favorite things about the job? If somebody was kind of saying like, man, I'm thinking about working at Wrigley Field, what would you say are the things that you've enjoyed most about what you've done working at Wrigley Field? I've got to say the first thing that you said it is the, the family atmosphere, the people, uh, in Chicago, we're one of the only remaining that I know of uh, place sports that hire their own staff, like family. We're not like outsourced out at all. Uh, and because of that, it's like going to school. The school year begins, the school year ends. There's some there's winter break and you come back. Uh, we go to each other's funerals and each other's weddings. And we're in each other's weddings and go to our kids' graduations and things like that. So I think the family atmosphere uh, makes it unique. Um and the culture and the tradition that goes on, you know, our, our we started with Andy Frame back in the day and uh, moved over to the in-house and some of those same traditions from back then we still do today. That's great. And, and for you personally, what are some things that can be frustrating about the job? Because everybody has jobs where they, there's good and bad. What, what's for you is kind of one of the frustrating things that kind of goes on that you got to deal with sometimes. You know, it's funny because, you know, and again, this is me talking as Frank, not as a employee of the, of the coast, but, um, I've learned not to take things personally. Uh, I did it in the beginning when I was younger. Uh, you know, I've had you and you've seen me in action in the bleachers, in the bleachers but I really learned to think to not to take things personally anymore. Uh, so nothing really gets to me. Uh, I think, I think all of us in general just wish, you know, if, if everybody just respected each other and, you know, treat each other with respect, uh, we, we would all get along very well. But I gotta say, you know, 99% of the time, uh, it's a smooth, even day. 
uh, for us. And most Cup fans are, you know, I think that, you know, it's not a cliche, but I think, you know, some of the best in the world because we know that we're in the friendly confines. I love it when a fan, uh, somebody is new, comes in and wants to do something wrong, and another fan stops them and says, hey, we don't do the wave here, or, <laughs> or we don't do this here. Um, and they work with us to keep the, the place safe. I love that about it. Uh, yeah, very, very but, much so, man, when you talk about the, because I've seen that, you know, I know my Thai guy's a guy that, you know, Bleacher Jeff, guys like that will sit there, hey, like, that's not cool. Hey, batter in the box, sit on down, don't lean on the, you know, just trying to kind of help out and just say, hey, there, there's just like rules, you know what I mean? Like if you would come into somebody's house, how you want to respect it, how it should be treated. Mm. And, and again, you know, the other thing you mentioned about that family atmosphere, like one of my first things I do opening day when I go to Wrigley's, I go up that concourse mm. and I see Mikey, who's my usher, who's been my usher for I don't know how long and just give him a big hug. And, and, and I think when you're a season ticket holder, you do create those bonds. So you get your beer vendors, you got your ushers, you know, you talk to your security guys, if you're in the bleachers, you know, those type of things, it creates a bond between the employees and the fans. Yeah. You know, it was interesting. I was in London, a uh, great experience uh, a couple of week, last week as it was, and I saw several season ticket holders. Now I wasn't in uniform. I was in my street clothes, but they recognized you know, Frank from Wrigley Field. And it was cool to be able to take pictures with them and things like that, you know, interactions. Uh, I don't know how that played out on the St. Louis Cardinal side. But I got to <laughs> tell you, on the Cubs side, when I walked around that stadium and Cub fans and team holders recognized me, they made a point to come and stop and say hi, say hi to Jordan, take a picture with us. Uh, and that just goes to show you, by the way, Cub fans travel very well, even internationally. Just to oh. let's go on. <laughs> We heard that go Cubs go loud and clear from yes. London. <laughs> now, yes. another thing that's cool about you is that you also kind of get to work in other sports. You get to work for the bears and this is going to make some people jealous when I say mm -hmm. this, but you, I was, you know, we follow each other on Facebook and on other mm -hmm. social media. You were at the Taylor Swift concerts and you walked away impressed. Yes. I was not a Swifty and maybe one now. Uh, the, the concert was amazing. Um, I got to tell you, wa watching grown uh, people, especially women, grown women, come to the gate, out to the gate, scanning their ticket, and just start crying and bawling, could not believe that they made it to see Taylor Swift. That was impressive to me. I've just, I've just never experienced, other than the World Series at Wrigley Field when they were coming in, I just never experienced grown people just breaking down and crying. I cannot, when their ticket wasn't, uh, when it wasn't fake, it was real, <laughs> and they, they made it in, the, just the tears flowing. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, so I, I was, I'm really impressed with that. Now, Frank, you brought up the World Series, and uh, I know a lot of employees got rings. Yes. Were you, what, when you found out about employees getting rings, how, what, what, what did they, when you got to see those, what kind of clicked in your head? Uh, I can't believe this is my life. Um, <laughs> and again, this is me talking personally, not as an employee, but um, – you know, I, I had been there when it was in the 90s, when we're maybe getting, you know, 10,000 fans and 15,000 fans. And so and um, it was always just known that, you know, we were never going to make, you know, the World Series back then. Uh, and to know all the people that had worked for the Cubs who are no longer there or no longer with us um, physically, uh, it was just emotional to know that, you know, we made it to this point. Um, it's something I'll never forget. And do you have a ring yourself? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, the day I got it, uh, my church wanted to see it, and I took it to church. And there was a lot after church. There was a line of people at my church <laughs> trying on the ring and taking photos. I think I was at church for an hour after the service because people just they were just in line to take pictures with the World Series ring. And and and, and, and you know, here's what I'm talking as a fan here. The Ricketts didn't have to do that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like they, they didn't have to get everybody rings and stuff like that. And, and that just kind of goes to show you, you know, I, I know some people get mad. Oh, the, the payroll's not high enough. Oh, the beer prices are too. Uh, you know, they, they do a lot of things too for the fans and for their employees that I think kind of sometimes people just kind of look at the negative sometimes and not the positive. Yeah, and, and again, speaking, I'm representing myself here, but the, the, the Cubs organization has done a lot for me when I was in need outside of Wrigley Field. Uh, I could pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm, I'm, this situation is going on, and uh, I, we got you. We'll take care of you. So uh, even as a, um, a person who's not working on the clock, who's in need, uh, the Cubs have done it, or as an organization, have done uh, exceedingly abundantly, more than I can even ask for. Um, 
And I will always be grateful for that. I will, I will, I have to ask you though, you, is that there has to be times where you guys dread certain days and I'm just going to think, I'm going to throw this out here because you know, I love my bobbleheads, but especially I remember 2017, 2018, there was just bobblehead madness where they were lining up early and people were struggling to get them. Do you guys, you know, do some of the employees kind of just go, Oh God, bobblehead day. Here we go. <laughs> I mean, so I don't, I don't think for me, I, I will say that for me personally, uh, Beanie Baby Day back in the day was worse, I thought. Um, just for me personally, I was younger then, but uh, I know there were police on horses and things like that. Um, I, think that I mean, just from, again, from a personal aspect and people that come on the podcast and talk about um, things, we've sort of, we're sort of immune to Bobblehead Day now. I don't, you know, we, we enjoy it. Um, uh, people have gotten you know, used to it now. And I'm, I'm not sure what the, the craze is, you know, plateaued out or not, but uh, from a personal, uh, my personal feelings about it is, I mean, I think we're pretty much immune to it now. And I think that you guys have done a good job of adjusting to the cup snakes and that whole situation. Uh, so, yeah, I can't really get into that, but I will say that, <laughs> I will say that uh, again, you know, uh, we try to be respectful and we ask for respect back as, you know, personally, because we, you know, we, we have families and lives outside of it, we feel. Um, but again, you know, uh, you know, respect is the key and every aspect of life. Yeah. You guys have been able to adjust to that situation because when it first came out, it's kind of crazy, but now you guys, guys kind of got rules and everyone respects them. I did. Well, I will say this when I was in London, I did see cup snakes in London. So I was actually observing, um, how their staff handled it. Um, and it was, it was cool. To, I wouldn't say cool. It was interesting, interesting to see cup snakes in London. Uh, that, I didn't expect to see that at all, but they, they that, were there. That's how it started. It started in England. I want to say in England in soccer games and stuff like that. And then it got brought over here. So, you know, it, it, it is crazy, but tell me a little bit more about the upcoming uh, season. What do what do you, what are your plans for the mistaken identity podcast and what do you kind of plan on doing for this season? Yeah. So, you know, it, you know, like in, in the past, we did a lot of with the, with players and we've had actually none players. We've had like Sherry Shepard has been on, um, on our podcast wrestlers, Mick Foley, uh, we've had on our podcast and I think so for season three, we really want to look uh, more at about uh, the different uh, hobbies that our employees have, like who are chefs and who do things that you may not have expected that they do. Uh, also sharing some interesting stories uh, like you would not believe that one of our staff members actually went into labor on the terrace level or the mezzanine <laughs> level that really feel. So sharing some of those stories that you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened. Um, sharing some of those things in a personal life of our staff is like our focus for season three. Well, I, I can't wait, Frank, to tune in. And, and where can our listeners uh, find out more information about the podcast and about yourself and following you on Twitter? Yeah, so we're on all uh, podcast platforms. You can search for Mistaken Identity Beyond the Ballpark, uh, or you can find us on Twitter at Podcast Mistaken or on Facebook at Mistaken Identity Media, as well as on Instagram. And wherever you, you stream your podcast from, you'd be able to get it as well. And, and you can subscribe, and it's great. Frank, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day, jumping on here. And I guess from somebody that, you know, has been going to games for, you know, boy, we're talking over 40-some years now. Again, from, from myself and I know many other Cub fans, we just want to thank you and everybody that works at Wrigley Field for all the tremendous work that you do. Because, again, without the employees, um, it, it's not as friendly of a confine. Do you get my saying? Yes, and uh, thank you as well for always being supportive of everything we do. Matter of fact, when people tune into our podcast, the intro, they'll hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> So that, you know, hey, man, it, 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 I love it. You guys are the best. I thank you, Frank, and I'll see you at the ballpark. Yes, thank you very much. This is Season 2, Episode 49 of the Fly the W670 Podcast. You cannot spell Tyone without an L. Crowley, that was a nice job on that interview. Let's get into the standings after the Cubs are stumbling after London and back at Wrigley Field. Yeah, it's just uh, the, you were getting to, <laughs> what I'm concerned about is we are now getting to the point where decisions have to be made and the way that the Cubs are performing. Unfortunately, those decisions aren't looking good right now. Uh, right now, Cincinnati and Milwaukee are battling for first place. They are tied at the top of the division, 45 and 39. Pittsburgh has now passed the Cubs, 39 and 44. 
They are five and five on a two game losing streak, but the Cubs are four and six on a two game losing streak at 38 and 44 St. Louis 9.5 back um, with, you know, you know, still in the basement, but everyone keeps saying, well, the division's bad. The division's bad. I mean, right now there's only like a handful of teams that have a worse record than the Cubs right now. St. Louis being one of them. Um, but you know, the only way you're going to win to make the postseason is by the division. And right now the Cubs are six out of that. I mean, I know people can say you can go on a run, but time is not on their side here anymore. No, the time is definitely, the time is definitely now we're going to get into their upcoming series in a moment, but yesterday afternoon, we started finding out about the uh, Cubs all-star representatives. Yeah. How great was that? Uh, the Cubs released a video of the announcement, uh, which, which was really cool to kind of see that. I love when they kind of give us a behind the scenes look the first. So David Ross comes out to say, this is his favorite part of the job. First all-star announced was Dan B. Swanson making his second all-star game. And, you know, I think Dan B. Swanson was somebody that people had a pretty good idea was going to make the all-star game. And he got a good round of applause from his teammates. Next up announced was Marcus Stroman also making his second all-star game appearance again, cheers. And I don't think we had any doubt Marcus Stroman was going to make it, but after both announcements, uh, you know, they were, they were cheering, but David Ross finally announces that Justin Steele was selected to his first all-star game and the locker room erupted. Obviously it's a big deal to make your first all-star game. And again, I, I think that Justin, you know, like, uh, for Chicago fans, we love him. We know him, but he may, may not get as much love nationally, you know? And, and so I think uh, when you saw the other day when they were playing Cleveland, Terry Francona was like, yeah, this kid's the real deal. So the, you know, people who are getting to see him, whether managers, whether it's players, whether it's media, he's not as well known as say Stroman and Swanson. So a really awesome moment. And I can just say, I had a pleasure. I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Justin Steele and, it was an honor. He's such a great kid, He's such a great family. And to be able to see him get this honor after all the hard work, all the, again, you're talking to guy, you know, drafted in what 2014, I believe, you know, to finally make an all-star game was just a huge moment. Right. Well-deserved on all yeah, accounts. Yeah, I don't think you can say that any of those saw, are questionable or borderline. They all deserve that honor. I'm happy for all of them. Obviously you don't want them doing too much in the game because you want them to get their rest, but you also want them to, uh, have the chance to go up against the uh, other side of the uh, league, you know, the NL versus the AL, even though it's not quite the same as it was when you and I were growing up where we got to, uh, you know, see the American league far less often unless you lived in a big market, but it's still, it's still a special type of thing. And uh, I think it's something that uh, Justin Steele will be uh, doing multiple times in his career. Let's get into a little bit of the injury report and roster moves, Crowley. Yeah, some bad news on Brad and Boxberger. He continues to deal with inflammation in his arm. He's been kind of pitching out in Arizona, um, and it just it's it's not getting better. His progress has been slowed down. So who knows when we're going to see Brad Boxberger next on this team? And then they got a little bit of uh, roster moves from the Myrtle Beach South Bend area, right? Right, yeah. From Myrtle Beach to South Bend, right-handed pitchers Angel Gonzalez and Brody McCullough have been promoted. I am really interested in Brody McCullough. That's just kind of a name that I don't know. I'm just, you know, I, I try to kind of look through these things and say to myself, who would the average Cub fan, who's someone that should be on your radar? Brody McCullough is a guy that, that I, I think that I'm curious to see how he performs in South Bend. Hopefully, uh, hopefully he, he does really well and continues to progress through the minor leagues. All right, Crowley, I'll keep an eye on him for the uh, series on marquee, right? The road to Wrigley. I'll feel we'll see a little bit of him. On that one. All right, Crowley, it starts a little bit later today. Cubs versus the Brewers north of the Cheddar Curtain. And Crowley, on the Mully and Haw show, we have a lot of fun with uh, statement games, must wins. I think the Cubs are in that situation right now. A couple minutes ago, we talked about how, you know, the time is now. There is no, uh, you know, tomorrow for this ball club. Obviously, there's plenty of way to go, but they've got to make a statement if they're going to be a, a player. You know, Tom Ricketts came on and Jed came on right ahead of the London series talking about how the team was going to be buyers. Well, I'll tell you what, if you don't win, you don't at least split up in Milwaukee. I don't see how you're buyers at all. Dustin splits not good enough at this point. Um, Normally, you know, me and my prediction times, it's always a split. If you don't take at least three or four from the brewers, it's a failure because you, you know, it's, it's all you did was just burn games off the schedule. 
Well, now the one good news is the one good news, Crowley, is that Tyone will not be pitching in this series, correct? Um, four games. You are, you are correct. Him. No Tyone. Get, yes. All right, there we go. So uh, Cubs are four games over 500 without Tyone start. So hopefully that trend continues. Let's get into the uh, July 3rd game. That's today up in uh, Milwaukee. Well, you know that the last time that the Cubs played the Brewers, it, it's been a while. It was the opening series in 2023. The Brewers took two or three. Uh, a pair of aces took the mound on opening day with Mark and Stroman taking on Corbin Burns. And the Cubs won this one four to nothing. They scored four runs in the third thanks to Dansby Swanson driving in two runs and Trey Mancini and Jan Gomes driving in a run as well. Stroman would give us a preview on how he would perform the season, going six innings, giving up no runs, only three hits. Game two, though, that was a disappointing loss. Justin Steele took on Brandon Woodruff, and like Stroman, Steele previewed what his 2023 would look like. He pitched six innings, gave up three hits and no runs. Ian Happ hit a home run. The Cubs are up one nothing in the eighth. But then Javier Assad, who is coming off a hot World Baseball Classic, came in. He allows the Brewers to tie it. And then if you remember this play, it was Miles Mastroboni in right field. He couldn't make a play, and the Cubs would lose 3-1. to one. And finally, in a preview of Justin Tyone's, <laughs> Justin Tyone's 2023 season, he gave up three runs in four innings, and then the Brewers, the Brewers blew it open against Julian Merriweather with a five-run fifth as the Cubs fell 9-5. to five. So the Brewers took two of three. So that seems about we, six months ago at this point, Crowley. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> I remember, I remember I was coming home from uh, Iowa. We watched yep. the Iowa Cubs and watching that play. We actually had it on a phone while we were driving back and we were watching the game on Mark on the, on the app and watching master Boney miss that play it was really brutal. So um, we get into this series. We got, you know, we're going to be starting it off today uh, in the cheddar curtain at AmFam. I'm going to try to make a game. I think I'm going to try to catch the last. Okay. Game. All right. You know, it, it, it's, it's to me, I always, you know, I'm in Wisconsin right now. So it's always kind of fun to maybe check out and see what, you know, I like going to different parks, but when we talk about today's game, you, you know, you're, you're talking about July 3rd, we're almost there. July 4th. It's a one ten start. Drew Smiley in his seven and five record with a 3.96 ERA, going against the veteran Julio Tehran, two and three with a 2.85 ERA on this one. Uh, just looking at the way that this is kind of all playing out. You remember Drew Smiley did not have the greatest of starts last time out. Very disappointing um, against the Phillies. He only went 3.2 innings. He gave up seven earned runs. But the two, the start before that against Pittsburgh, you went five innings, gave up three hits, no runs. But then the start before that, also against Pittsburgh, he went six innings, he gave up nine hits and five earned runs. So two of the last three starts he's had have not been good. Let's hope that continues. That's all we can do at this point, right, Crowley? Let's hope. That well, continues. no, we don't want that to continue. We need oh, that saying, to turn, turn I'm around. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I thought you meant Julio Tehran. Oh, sorry, no, no, yes. I'm talking Drew Smiley. Smiley man. I, he went out there for a minute. Yeah, so he's he's uh, he's struggling, so we need him to kind of turn it back around. Now, Julio Tehran's an interesting one here because he did not start the year with the team. He's had to come because of injury issues. And so with Tehran, he made he signed late in the season. He signed on May 25th. So he, he's, he's a guy that, you know, he's 32 years old. He's, he's a veteran. Uh, he's, he's done pretty well for them so far, you know, considering the situation, uh, he's only started, you know, he's only started six, seven games for these guys right here. He's two and three with a two eighty five ERA. Yeah, nice so, ERA. That's for sure. Against the Mets. He really struggled. He went 5.2 innings, gave up seven hits, seven earned runs. But against a really good Diamondback team, he went five innings, gave up two hits, no run. And against a good Pittsburgh uh, team, six innings, one hit, two earned runs. So, you know, hopefully it's more like the last start and not the previous two starts. Let's hope the offense wakes up on the bus ride up. That's all you can ask for. Now, a guy that has been doing well for the Cubs, Kyle Hendricks, three and three with a 281 ERA, the professor calling his own games. <laughs> and, you know, you wonder if in the future you could see him as a possible, uh, you know, pitching coach, just a really bright guy. Uh, 
He's he's done really good against Philadelphia. He went seven innings pitch, six hits, three earned runs. That's a quality start. Another quality start against Pittsburgh, 6.1 innings, two hits, one earned run. And against Baltimore, 5.0 innings, five hits, two earned runs. So, you know, the professor doing the professor type things, doing good. The, he's going to be facing Wade Miley. Dustin, I got to ask, did you just know the second that the Brewers signed Wade Miley that it was just going to be a totally different story than how he was when he was with the Cubs? No, not at all. I had hoped that he was going to take his junk with them there. Um, but he's been pretty decent for them. 11 starts, 5-2, and two, 302 ERA. I instantly knew the second they signed him, it was like he was, he was injured all the time against the Cubs yeah, with the Cubs. Hurt. And now he's with the Brewers and he's doing great things. Um, the last start, he didn't go that long. He didn't pitch effectively, but he went four innings, gave up three hits, two earned runs. He had three walks and three strikeouts, so his pitch count got elevated. Against Cleveland, who we just saw, he went six innings, gave up three hits, zero runs. Against Pittsburgh, five innings, two hits, zero runs. We remember last year with Miley, he looked really good a lot, and then but but he just couldn't stay healthy. And so that's what you're really kind of seeing against him. He's, he usually goes about five to six innings. Not often does he go much more than that. And, you know, it's uh, he gives up two, three runs tops. I, I think it's going to be a tough challenge for the Cubs to, to, to have to face him. That's a really interesting pitching matchup in game two. No doubt about that. That's the 4th of July game, Crowley. Correct. Then we have Justin Steele on the bump. Uh, we've said, you know, now a first-time All-Star, 9-2, 243 ERA. He has won his last three games against Cleveland, St. Louis, and Baltimore. He gave up zero runs against Cleveland, one run against St. Louis, and two runs against Baltimore. Guy is pitching like an All-Star, and it's, we're glad that he has finally gotten the recognition that he deserves. Lucky to have him, no doubt about that. Now, when we look on the other side, we got Adrian Hauser. With Adrian Hauser, you're talking about a guy that has started 10 games and he's gone three and two. He struggled against the Mets last time out, going six innings. Well, not really. He only went six innings, gave up seven hits, two earned runs against Cleveland. Uh, he had an abbreviated start. That was on 623. He gave up zero runs, but he only pitched one inning. And then on 619 against Arizona, he went four innings pitch. He gave up one earned run. So Hauser's kind of been a guy that's kind of given them some spot starts. He, he's not a guy. He did not start on the 19th and the 23rd. So he's a guy that's kind of, you know, he was on the IL. He had a, an injury. He had some groin tightness. So he's just kind of coming back from that. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Fingers crossed. Cr fingers crossed. Now, the last match it should be the most interesting of them all, in my opinion. When you, you got Marcus Stroman on the bump for the Cubs. Again, another all-star. Wasn't the worst start for him last time out. Uh, he went, again, against Cleveland, 5.2, five hits, five earned runs. But two of those came off of Julian Merriweather, um, who inherited the runners. Against St. Louis, he had the blister, so he only went three innings, gave up three and runs. And then before that was a really good game against Pittsburgh, seven innings pitch and zero earned runs on five hits. So that was a good start, but the last two starts have kind of been question marks coming back from that blister. Yeah, the blister is something that you have to keep in mind with that, right? It's not an excuse, but it's something you have to you know understand and consider and, and say, hey, I get it. Now, he's going to be facing Freddie Peralta, and Freddie Peralta started 16 games this year, and he's 5-7 and seven with a 467 ERA. I can tell you Milwaukee fans are disappointed with Peralta. He had a really great season last year. You, you expected him to take that next step, and he just really hasn't. Uh, last, game, last couple games, though, he's been heating up lately, so that would be something that I would kind of tell Cup fans to keep in mind. And so, um, you know, he, he had a bad start to the season where he was giving up some runs, uh, you know, but right now, lately, against Pittsburgh, he went 5.1, gave up three earned runs. Against Cleveland, he went five-point innings, gave up three earned runs. Against Pittsburgh, six innings, two run, earned runs. So he's another guy that right now, very similar to Wade Miley, he's going to go five, six innings, no more than that, really. 
but he's only going to give up two, three runs. If you look at the month of June, you know, he gave up four runs against Oakland, which what was he thinking there? But after that, he hasn't given up more than three or runs in any other start. Well, the Cubs offense is going to have to wake up, Crowley. There's no doubt about that. We can't have any of these 10, 13 strikeout performances and can't be going one for 10 with runners in scoring position if you hope to win what is a very, very important series. we got three day games coming up, right? One night game. Game three is a night game, if I'm right. Yes, sir. All right, let's get into it. Who's hot? Who's not? Cubs side. All right, we look at the Cubs side. Who is hot? You can take a look. How about Cody Bellinger kind of kind of getting hot lately? He's 10 for his last 23 with an RBI. He's slashing 435, 445, 22. And then Nick Madrigal, seven hits in his last 18 at bats with a home run and an RBI, slashing 389, 389. Look at that 611 power number for Nicky Madrigal. Woo! <laughs> Nick Madrigal, hot for two cycles of this thing we uh, we do this segment. So good for good for Nick Madrigal. And the knot? Uh, that would be Dansby Swanson right now with three for his last 24, one home run, one RBI. He's slashing 125, 160, and 292. And then also take a look at, um, I would say, Ian Happ, 17 at one hit for his last 17 at bats. He's not an all star this year. He's slashing 0.059, 0.200. Point oh five nine. We've talked about it. He is a guy that has really, uh, really, really struggled right now with um, anybody not named Adam Wainwright. So definitely not an all star this year. No, definitely not. All right, let's move over to the Brew Crew, Crowley. Who's hot? We haven't seen them in quite a while. So who's uh, who's been doing it for the Brew Crew? The Brew Crew is kind of weird, where they have a lot of different guys. They don't have play like a ton of regulars, but um, right now Jesse Winker's five for his last fifteen. With five RBIs, he's always given the Cubs fits when he played with Cincinnati, uh, slashing 333, 412, 467. Brian Anderson, third baseman, a nice pickup for them in the offseason, going seven for 22 with three RBIs. He's slashing 318, 304, 364. As far as the Nats are concerned, Rowdy Telez. Now, be careful. He always seems to hit the Cubs really well. Yes, three he does. Three for his last 18 with three RBIs. He's slashing 167, 238, 222. And then Joey Weimer is their center fielder. He's three for their last 19 with one home run and two RBIs. He's slashing 158, 333, 368. Uh, one guy that's surprisingly on that list is Willie Adamas, another guy that you'd expect to have a better year. He's four for his last 27, and he's slashing 148, 294, and 259. All right, Crowley, it, here we go. This this is a hard one for me because this Brewer team, when I look at their lineup, right, when you just look at them, they don't look that impressive, in my opinion. I don't sit there and go like, who's the guy that scares you? You know how we always kind of talk about right, that? Who's the right. guy that puts the fear into you? The Milwaukee Brewers have a negative run differential right now, and so that, that that's the thing that kind of blows me away is I'm like, how is this team doing what they're doing? And it's just – the, their bullpen's been tight. They hit when it matters, Dustin. When when it counts, they seem to get the big hit, and there always seems to be a different hero every day. It's one of those type of teams when you look at it. But when I look at the Bre Brewers, it's like, how are they doing this? It's like I look at their lineup. Their averages are not that great. You know, uh, the, the, their top hitter, and I'm looking at this right now, uh, their 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 designated hitter is batting two fifty five. I mean, is that anything that scares you? No, but you just you you said it perfectly. Nobody scares you on this team. They must do really well with runners in scoring position, and obviously we talked about their starting pitching and their low ERA. So they must be low low scoring game so far this year for that team. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know me on four game series. I'm gonna go with the split. I'm not happy about it. Um, I, I don't think that's gonna be helpful. Uh, but I would, I would say at this point in time, that that's what I think is going to happen. All right. So you're going uh two and two, I'm going to go three and one Crawley. I'm just going to try to be just a bit more optimistic in this one because the Cubs 
really, really need it. Trying to will, uh, trying to will a Cubs win. I like it. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on the socials. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Email us fly the w six seventy gmail dot com. And of course, you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the six seventy the score YouTube channel. Everybody out there have a fun and most importantly safe Fourth of July weekend. Yes, and, and, and if you have a chance, head up to Milwaukee. I'll be there. We could cheer on the Cubs, and hopefully, like Dustin says, they take three, maybe four. All you can do is wish. Go Cubs! Hey, guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!